What is mini stem or minimal stimulation IVF and should you be considering it? Hi friends, I'm Dr. Natalie Crawford. I'm a board certified OBGYN and REI. I'm a fertility doctor and I talk to patients each and every day about their fertility and about IVF. And one thing that drives me nuts is how some practices will really take advantage of the fact that this is a very foreign concept to many people. And a lot of their marketing and a lot of the messaging really might lead you toward making a decision that's not in your best interest. And one of those things is mini stem IVF. So I'm going to break that down for you today, what it is, what it's not, and what does the evidence say about it? Now this channel exists to help you learn more about your body and your fertility. And so I would love it if you would subscribe to help us share our message about fertility education. So when it comes to mini stem, modified, mini IVF, minimal stem, low cost, low complexity, there's a lot of different words people will throw out there. The take home message is what they are talking about is the stimulation form of IVF. The rest of the process goes pretty much the same. So let's do just an overall review of the process. In order to understand IVF and in order to understand mini stem IVF, you have to understand the concept of ovarian reserve. How I like to explain this is if you imagine a vault inside your ovary where all your eggs are kept, when you're born, that vault is full and throughout your life, eggs exit the vault. And when the vault is empty, now you're in menopause. What actually happens is each month an entire group of eggs each comes out of the vault. Each egg grows inside a follicle. Your brain in a normal month would send out follicle stimulating hormone, a well-named hormone, to stimulate one of these follicles to grow. The egg matures and ovulates and the rest of them die. And the next month, another group is released. Now, what is interesting is the more eggs you have in the vault, the more that come out every month and the fewer eggs that you have remaining, the fewer that come out every month. And so evaluating the eggs outside the vault is called evaluating your ovarian reserve. This can be done with an ultrasound measurement of counting the follicles. You can actually see those on ultrasound, and that's called an antral follicle count or an AFC, or with a blood test called AMH or anti-mullerian hormone. Why this is important is that if I try to simplify any type of stimulation IVF in a nutshell, all I can do is get all of the eggs that are outside the vault to grow. And those are the ones I'm taking out of the body with the egg retrieval, fertilizing them with sperm, and then making embryos and either transferring or freezing or doing genetic testing. So that part is in vitro fertilization. All types of IVF require eggs coming out of the body with an egg retrieval and being combined with sperm in some form or fashion to make embryos. Now, depending on your age, your medical history, and your ovarian reserve, there's different protocols or combination of medications that we use to get the eggs outside the vault to grow. Meaning, if you have more eggs, you need to do something different than if you have less. And that makes sense. If I'm trying to get 30 eggs to grow, I'm gonna do something different than if I'm trying to get three to grow. So truly the idea of a minimal stimulation protocol is that I can stimulate you with less medication, less total dose, and still get eggs to grow. So in my mind, in the perfect world, it is one of your protocols that as an IVF doctor you would utilize and not a selling or a marketing point. And I'll get back to that. So types of mini or modified, you might hear it, minimal dose, minimal stimulation, mini IVF, modified IVF. There's a few different words that people use. In general, you are going to be requiring less medication if you have fewer eggs. Makes sense, because there's only so many FSH receptors. So if you don't have 30 eggs, you only have three, can I get away with using less because I'm only trying to get three to grow? That's the hypothesis. Now, how do we do it? Well, there's a true natural cycle, which is I'm just following the one egg that you have and I take it to retrieval. That is an option if you are not gonna be able to stimulate and get more than one. Then there's mini stem, which can mean a lot of different things, but in most studies, it means using either a pure gonadotropin dose of less than 150 units, or using just letrozole or just Clomid, so oral agents that increase the release of FSH, or a combination of both of them, 
but still a lower dose of gonadotropin every day. And that's in contrast to conventional IVF, where you're using FSH plus typically an FSH-LH combination or a higher dose gonadotropin total. Most conventional simulation protocols started a dose closer to 300 total units a day versus mini stem at 150 or less units a day. So in principle, I love mini stem. If you don't have very many eggs, why do I need to give you all of these medications? Now, what do I not like? I don't like that there are places that are telling you that minimal stimulation IVF is giving you better quality eggs. There is zero evidence to support that because the eggs are the same eggs. They've been exposed to your same environment. The only thing that's different is the small dose of medication over less than two weeks of time, and that is not changing their quality. Quality is related to genetics. Genetics are related to age. So it could it save you money? Potentially, yes. Is it making your eggs better quality? Absolutely not. So that is a marketing ploy where people will say mini sim is better for you. It's more natural. You have better eggs. And there's, there's zero evidence to support that. There is evidence to support the fact that for patients who are poor responders, doing a minimal stimulation protocol likely yields you the same amount of eggs and the same amount of elastasis as a conventional stimulation protocol. And I even know in my practice, for somebody who I think is going to get six or fewer eggs, I lead in to a minimal stimulation protocol. It's typically a Clomid FSH overlap. I don't call it mini stem and I'm not marketing that, but it is a protocol that I am selecting for that very poor responder patient. Now, I also see people who potentially have a normal ovarian reserve or high egg count and they're doing a minimal stimulation protocol. And the important thing to remember here is that studies have not shown that minimal stimulation is beneficial unless you're a poor responder, meaning I don't need as much dose if you don't have as many eggs, so they're equal for the stimulation. Mini stem doesn't have a higher chance of giving me a baby, doesn't have a higher chance of giving me better eggs. But if you have a higher egg count number and now I am skimping on your stimulation, you're gonna walk out of there with fewer total eggs, fewer embryos, because you purposefully understimulated somebody. Now there are times when you choose to do this with proper counseling and a really good example is InvoCell. InvoCell is a small device that some clinics use with a minimal stimulation protocol. With the InvoCell, you still go through the medications, the hormone shots, and you still do the egg retrieval, but then you put egg and sperm together in this device and incubate it inside the vagina, and then pull it out five days later, take an embryo and transfer it, and freeze if there's any others. The reason why InvoCell is combined with mini stem is one, to save money, but two, the device only holds eight to 10 eggs, so I don't need 20 eggs. So if I'm trying to save money by allowing you to incubate your embryos in your body, I can't have 20 eggs. So it is a purposeful decision that I'm going to accept less eggs because it makes the process more affordable to me and now I can do it. Side note is not everybody's an InvoCell candidate. And I also see clinics throw InvoCell on patients who aren't great candidates. If you have unexplained infertility, if you have male factor infertility, if you're older and you need genetic testing or you've had recurrent pregnancy loss, I don't love InvoCell for that. I think it's really fabulous for a PCOS patient who's not responding to oral medication alone. And I think it can be really great for somebody with tubal disease who is younger. So I think it has its place and it is an option that I will also combine a minimal stimulation protocol. Although I will tell you 90% of the patients who I talk to and I counsel them through expected egg yield, how many embryos that makes and what this means for their age actually elect not to do it because they realize even if conventional IVF is costing more money, it is yielding them with more embryos and therefore more opportunities to grow their family. I even did a study back when I was a fellow and this was a cost analysis study. So if we wanna argue, well, mini stem is so much cheaper so I can do more cycles. Well, the cost analysis, because the pregnancy rate is lower if you're getting fewer eggs, is that mini stem doesn't save you money. It might save you a per cost basis, but the rate of success per cycle is so much lower that it doesn't save you money overall. So that argument, I don't buy. I also, I still believe with my mini stem protocols and patients who are older, 35 and older, that we should be doing genetic testing of embryos. And that's because I 
a data person. I like the data. I want to get you to that highest success rate possible, which is a genetically normal embryo. And if you're older, your age is a barrier that we need to acknowledge. But also I will admit my bias as somebody who lost numerous pregnancies. I think that there is a benefit in not transferring an embryo that does not have a potential to become a child or has a high chance of miscarrying. I have colleagues who will put older patients, 43 year olds, through mini stem protocols and just transfer any and all embryos that make it to the blastocyst stage. That might sound great, the clinic's getting money because you're doing lots of cycles and lots of transfers. You as a patient are getting opportunities to get pregnant with the transfers, but this is not a yes, no situation. Meaning if you're not pregnant and you can turn around the next month and do it again, fantastic. But what we find is you might get pregnant and miscarry three to four months later, and now you're out of trying for a substantial period of time. Whereas if I'm doing cycles and allowing the embryos to go to genetic testing, if I don't have any normal, I'm cycling you again. So we are more quickly banking cycles to try to get you to your child goal versus waiting on these potential miscarriages in between transfers. And to me, that is just not the best use of your time. In the only randomized controlled trial that exists to compare mini stem versus conventional IVF, it's important to note a few things. One is that it was set up not to reflect modern practice, meaning people who went through conventional IVF had a double embryo transfer and people who went through mini IVF had a single embryo transfer. The primary outcome was like birth rate after treatment. And so in the conventional IVF group under that double embryo transfer, not genetically tested arm, the cumulative life birth rate was 63%. The mini stimulation group, the cumulative life birth rate was 49%. These are both relatively good birth rates for IVF, and I think that has to be acknowledged. However, it was significantly higher in the conventional IVF group. And so the take home message here is this, on a per cycle basis, mini stem IVF might save you money. It does not result in the same pregnancy rates as conventional IVF. It potentially is a protocol strategy your team may use. It should be proceeded with caution in anybody with normal or high ovarian reserve. You need to be discussing expected embryo yield per cycle based on the protocol and the marketing strategies that promote better egg quality with less gonadotropin exposure is false. There's no evidence to support that. There has been prior evidence that a high gonadotropin dose may be associated with a lower live birth rate in a fresh transfer cycle, which we know, and that's why we do a lot of freeze-all cycles. But when we're talking about does that negatively impact the eggs? No, it impacts the endometrium negatively. And further, higher gonadotropin dose has not been associated with differences in rates of euploidy or genetically normal embryos when you do IVF. So if your team is saying conventional dose IVF is the right thing for you based on your ovarian reserve, that's what you should do because the success rate of IVF is going to be higher the more eggs that you can get. I do have an entire playlist and some videos on IVF if you wanna learn more about the nitty gritty of the process. Hope this video was helpful. As always, you can follow along on Instagram at Natalie Crawford MD or find out more on the As A Woman podcast. Thank you, friends.